This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have again with me this morning Charles U. Smith, well-recognized writer on the web who is the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Welcome back for our second session this week, uh, Charles. Thank you, Gordon. Charles, I, I want to jump right in on Japan. I've had a, a fair bit of discussion in recent shows of the magnitude of the debt that is in Japan, both um, government debt and the total size of the uh, debt, and how dependent are bonds being bought by Japan, and the surprising fact of where are they getting the money uh, to buy our bonds, but I won't. I, I'll just kind of leave that one here. These are the list of the m- many articles that you've written recently that, in some way, really touched on on Japan and a lot of your experiences. That, frankly, I can see you know having spent a lot of time in the in that area and in um, from Hawaii. But I wondered if you could just kind of take us through this morning on what we can learn from Japan and you know two de- and over two decades of stagnation. I think that Japan is a very interesting case study for us and I think a lot of people in the US and Europe look at Japan as a model for what happens when you um have stagnation and you rely on um endless fiscal stimulus, you know the government's constantly borrowing and spending more money to kind of keep the economy afloat and yet you never really get strong growth you just kind of drift along as your and your debt keeps increasing and then your interest payments keep increasing and that creates that basically sets up a, a death spiral and so a lot of us are wondering how come Japan has avoided that death spiral they keep borrowing immense sums of money uh, their interest rates even at 1% are starting to pile up to uh, to be a large uh, percentage of their of their government budget how uh what lessons can we draw from from their success if you will in in remaining a stagnant economy uh for two decades but not blowing up and so part of what we can uh start with is um uh, why is japan stagnating and and we can also ask why why is the us stagnating and we find that the demographics are part of it and that the uh, here's the employment population ratio in other words the percentage of the population who is in the workforce and japan and the us are both going down and we see here in the us that um here's the civilian employment population here in the us and it's back to the levels of the uh, the late 1970s early 1980s uh, a huge decline in in um the number of of people in the U.S. who are in the workforce. So we have fewer people working. And and so the national income declines when there's fewer people generating income. And uh, maybe we can move to the next uh, slide here. This is full-time uh, employment in the U.S. And, and you can see that it's returned to the levels of the late 90s. So even though the workforce uh, has grown by 33 million people, we still have the same number of full-time jobs, 115 million. So um, that's stagnation. You know, when you get income stagnation, you get stagnation in the entire economy for the obvious reason. People have, you know, less money to spend. And I think the next slide shows that not only is there um, a stagnation in the number of jobs, there's stagnation or actually decline in our um our compensation, and here's average hourly earnings. Uh, this is a year-over-year increase, and you can see that when the economy is growing, uh, you know, wages and salaries uh, rise, and people have more money. And when the economy is stagnating, then their their wages actually decline in terms of purchasing power. So, uh, Japan and the U.S. share that that trait of a stagnating economy. Um, and here in the U.S., we can see the critical, um, the, the age group 45 to 54, which is generally our peak earning years. And you can see that, uh, that income in that segment has actually declined by a 13% since the year 2000. 
that's a tremendous drop in, in, in income. And in Japan, uh, we don't have any charts to show it, but they, they're suffering similar, uh, degradations in their, in their labor, uh, pool that, uh, you know, a third of their jobs are part time making, uh, you know, 10, $12 an hour. Uh, so they're also suffering from a decline in, in, uh, in income throughout their economy. And so, um, we, this chart is, uh, the, the Japan's GDP minus government spending. And so what we're really trying to look at here is as the government borrows and spends more money, does it, uh, does it add to GDP or does it subtract from GDP? And so, you know, as we all know, there's been a massive global boom um, from the late 90s um, up through about 2007, uh, part of it fueled by the growth of China, part of it from the global credit housing bubble. And so Japan, uh, Japan's economy managed to grow, even though its government was borrowing and spending uh, and and often squandering the money on bridges to nowhere and so on, that the, the growth in, in Japan's export economy was so strong that it kind of overcame the drag of, of deficit spending. But once the global boom ended in 2007, then we see that now Japan's GDP is actually declining, that that government spending is, has created diminishing returns. Now the drag is, is dragging down the entire GDP. And I think we can look to the U.S., as experiencing a similar thing. This chart may look confusing, uh, a lot, but it's actually just a chart of, of the GDP, um, in a ratio with federal expenditures, like the federal spending. And so when the blue line is above the, the trend line, it means that the government spending is increasing faster than GDP. And so in our boom years of the internet and the housing bubble, the federal government, um, actually grew at a slower rate than the, the the economy, the economy and the GDP actually expanded faster than government for the first time in decades. And then now the boom is over. We have a credit crisis. We've got a fiscal crisis. And now, once again, the government uh, share of the GDP is shot up. And so the question is, how much, how long can your government grow faster than your underlying GDP? And of course, we all know the answer is it can't be forever because eventually the government will be the entire GDP. <laughs> And that doesn't work. Well, we're getting pretty close to that now. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, we are. Uh, let's see. And in the next slide, um, we, uh, you know, a lot of people look at what happens in, uh, is happening in Japan and they know that Japan is in, if not, it's in outright deflation. It's, it's basically flatlined. You know, the, the, the consumer price index is, is, um, near zero in Japan. And in fact, if for those people, my friends in Japan report that prices actually do go down, that, uh, that prices are lower. And so they, they are suffering from a very sort of low grade deflation. And I thought this chart was interesting because it shows in the first decade of, of Japan's stagnation where they tried to, uh, use Keynesian, um, stimulus to, uh, you know, federal, uh, their, their central government uh, borrowing and spending to rejuvenate their economy, it actually created a, a rather rapid rise in their CPI and their, their cost of living. But at some point, that their, their stagnation overcame that stimulus, and they've been in sta- kind of stumbling along in, in a deflationary zone for the last decade. So it, this, this shows that even if your government borrows and spends immense sums of money, if your underlying economy is stagnating, you can still end up with like deflation or uh, a flat line. No, no inflation and no serious deflation, but going nowhere. I would venture to say, uh, Charles, right now, that despite what the Federal Reserve and the politicians say, this is actually the goal in America right now is, in fact, if we could get it where it would be flatline as opposed to crumbling and falling down because and, and having negative real rate of growth so that it would just be um, be flat. But this is a very, very powerful chart. It's the first time I've seen this one. Um, and it really shows the two stages that Japan has went through. You're absolutely right, Gordon. That what we're seeing is uh, we're, we're trying to inflate our way, not so much um, – to hyperinflation, we're just trying to inflate our way to flatline instead of like a massive deflation. And that's all that Japan has really accomplished. And that's what we see here. With the amount of deleveraging, and that's a fancy word for saying defaults, 
and that is people who can't pay their mortgages, people who can't pay their student loan debts, people who can't pay their HELOC loans, and all of those non-performing lo loans are just going through the to the roof. We can print money out of nowhere, but we can also destroy money out of nowhere. So when somebody defaults on, on a loan or isn't making, that money disappears. And so that's when this chart says it starts to go down. The only way you offset it, but you print more money. And frankly, right now, that treadmill, I think the Fed is, as I said, is just trying to hold it equal so that we don't have contraction. And we're hoping that we can get growth. But right now, it's the contraction they're, they're more worried about. And so Japan has actually been, been doing a relatively stable job. I'm very worried in the future, as you point out, because of the demographics here. Because you've got fewer and fewer people, and especially with the negative trade balances now, negative current accounts that are now appearing in Japan, to be able to sustain itself. We can look at the U.S. Consumer Price Index in this next slide, and you can see that, um, as Gordon and I were just discussing, we've basically flatlined this thing. You know, the Fed uh, and um, has has pumped up uh, the money supply, and um, we've spent trillions of dollars in fiscal stimulus. And, and what we've really managed to do is keep our core inflation at above zero, but not by much. <laughs> and so we have rapid inflation in things like um, health care and, and college tuition. But overall, all those trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the U.S. economy have basically just kept us flatlined. I mean, you know, one one and a half, two percent, three percent, and inflation. So the next slide, we're going to talk about the the consequences, though, of of that constant borrowing and spending to keep the economy from deflating. And here's Japan's um, budget, and you can see that uh, the numbers are a little too small there. But at the beginning, uh, at the start of the red arrow, that's uh, the the start of Japan's stagnation. And you can see that uh, over the that last 20 years, their their debt has more than tripled, and uh, this doesn't even count their private debt. So they've they've created a a, a gargantuan mountain of debt uh, that that accrues interest, and even at one percent, uh, that's eating up by about a 40 percent of their budget. So that's the problem with this uh, borrow and spend to keep your economy. Uh, sort of in a zombie state is eventually the interest will rise and and crush your uh, crush your government. For our and listeners that aren't familiar, Charles, uh, we talk endlessly about the European uh, debt, and we talk about the peripheral countries, Greece, etc., and their level of debt to GDP. Um, it, it pales in comparison to Japan. The government debt to GDP is north of two hundred and twenty percent today, right now. Um, you have nobody in Europe even close to those kinds of, le of, of, of levels. Additionally, the total jet that, uh, debt that you had just mentioned is well north of 500%. That's the extent of which this chart on the amount of money they've produced, again, printed or created versus the actual size of the, uh, of the GDP. How long can that be sustained? That's the question on the table. Key that a lot of people have mentioned is that Japan is a nation of savers, and they have a very conservative uh, financial system that's interlocking. And so they have, like a lot of people have savings at the postal service, and, and, and they have large banks and insurance companies. And so all of these domestic financial entities have uh, invested heavily in, in government bonds. And so they've actually sort of self-funded uh, their incredible debt because they've, they've, they've created tremendous surpluses with their export machine and their populace is, is a fiscally conservative and a nation of savers. And so they've been able to um, own, they own like 95% of their own debt. And so that, of course, is not uh, the case in the U.S. or other countries. And so that's why Say, uh, say Spain, I think that their ratio might be a 120% or, or something like that, which doesn't look too severe compared to Japan's 220. But Japan has been able to march on because they have, they've saved $20 trillion, uh, 20, yeah, you know, in yen, but translated into dollars. They've saved 20 trillion yen and, and invested it in their own debt. But that's not sustainable for them because their workforce is shrinking. And so it doesn't, the demographics are going to catch up with that. Your points, Charles, are absolutely right. That is exactly the reason that uh, Japan has been so successful in managing a debt that is phenomenal. The difference now, though, in, which is so profound, is the demographics are now working 
beginning to work against them at an accelerating rate. And additionally, their trade balances are no longer positive. They're getting crushed competitively from the rest of the Asian tigers and their ability to produce, especially as costs go up and they're, an, they're an, a large importer of, of raw materials to export. And then you've got this demographic problem. And I, I know in one of your articles you were pointing out that so many of the youth today, the only reason that they have houses or have things is it's becoming from their parents who were the ones that were able to have created those savings to have created that level of wealth which tells you that the the new generations have no abilities to create the wealth, the, even the basics of, of what their parents had been able to create. That says the burden to create the ongoing interest payments to sustain an increasing debt is quickly coming to an end. You're, you're right. It, it's, it's, it can't last another 20 years. And, and um, just to compare it to the U.S., our next slide shows um, our own debt, which, as you can see, has skyrocketed from the low levels of the 70s and 80s. And it, it's basically taken an exponential turn from the year 2000. And so we're, we have the same problem. How are we going to support this, um, this kind of exponential debt? Um, and because interest rates, even at 1%, eventually overwhelm you, you know? And so we've got the same problem, but and and also our demographics i mean there's 75 million baby boomers and they're entering medicare and the social security systems at the rate of 10,000 people a day and if anybody thinks that that's sustainable um they're just not looking at the numbers and so the next slide shows who owns our debt and uh you know we, i don't want to get into too much complexity here but it's not surprising that uh over 50% of the of our uh, national debt is owned by foreign entities because we own the reserve currency and Japan does not have the global reserve currency. They have a currency that's the yen, which is similar to the euro. But we have the reserve currency, which means we have to put enough money into the global system that people have uh, money to trade with and, um, and to exchange their own currencies into and out of. And to, they need dollars to hold in as reserves. And so this has given the U.S. an advantage. You know, we, we can print uh, money that would crush other nations, but we get away with it, basically, as long as we have the reserve currency. And if, we're, if, that, if we lose the reserve currency or the whole global financial system moves to a multiple uh, currency or a gold-backed currency, then uh, we will lose that, that privilege of supporting our own deficit spending by just pumping money into the global economy. We'll lose our ability to export inflation is effectively what we'll do. <laughs> yes. And, and, and I, those days are quickly coming. The world's requirements for U.S. dollars um, as a trade are diminishing for a number of reasons. But, Charles, this chart you have up is an, a an excellent one, and it's historical about the, the magnitude of de uh, the United States debt that's, in fact, owned by, by uh, foreigners. But if you look at the rate which we're creating our debt, and let me use last year's at $1.5 trillion worth of increase in, in deficits, if you look at who was the biggest buyer and the biggest increase in buyer of our debt, it was Japan. So Japan has always been um, the largest buyer of our debt, second to China. Uh, but currently, China's not buying our debt. They're not selling it. Russia is selling it. But uh, Japan has had to step up with our increasing debt and buy more of it. So think of it this way, Charles. Not only do we have these problems we've just discussed in Japan and the size of their debt, but they're also funding our debt. Does that make sense, or is this a giant Ponzi scheme we have going here? <laughs> Well, they're certainly interrelated. And so if Japan's surplus declines and they don't have the cash to buy our debt, which they, they have, they yeah, don't, which they don't, <laughs> then, then what we're left with is the Federal Reserve printing more money and monetizing our debt by buying it itself. And then, you know, that's a, so we're, maybe it's a Ponzi scheme on top of a Ponzi scheme. Well, that's precisely what's going on because of, of the 1.5 trillion i mentioned the united states federal reserve effectively through mortgage backed securities took on 1.2 trillion of it and the increase and then we've taken our balance sheet to in the area of about 3 trillion dollars now in the federal reserve 
And I just finished reading a study by Bloomberg, and they've concluded that they believe by end of 2013, the United States Federal Reserve balance sheet will be $4 trillion. That's $1 trillion more increase that they see in the next uh, next year alone. That's substantial. So we have the two biggest debtors just produce, printing money money here at a phenomenal rate. Um, I don't think it's going to end well, that's for sure. I'll finish on this um, this last slide just to kind of try to wrap it up that um, we, we, we basically share certain traits with Japan that we can look to Japan as, as our future. And, and uh, that would be the demographic drag. That would be the stagnation of our underlying economy. And it would be the fiscal cliff facing us as uh, our ability to borrow enough money to fund the interest and um, all the other expenses uh, runs off a cliff. And then the difference is Japan has been a nation of savers, so they've been able to stagnate uh, without social, uh, without outright social disorder for like over 20 years uh, because we don't save that much. I don't think we have 23 years or 25 years. You know, we've already kind of burned through 12 years of extend and pretend, and we may be running out of time. And so um, the uh, Japan's GDP and, and uh, consumer price index stagnation might offer us a roadmap that that's what that's the best we're going to get is a stagnating economy and and a and a flatlined GDP and CPI. Charles, thanks for for sharing your insights on Japan. Uh, I know that you have a fair bit of exposure in that part of the world. Could you could you just share briefly with our our listeners, why you can bring so many of these personal stories to bear? Well, I think it starts with um, I studied um, Japanese language, um, Nihongo, in uh, in the university in the 70s and studied their economy, history, literature, and so on. And I also studied, uh, although China was closed at the time due to the Cultural Revolution, I also studied uh, a lot of the history and um and sociology of China at that time, and uh, being at that time in Hawaii, um, I had a, met a lot of people. And living in California, I, I uh, my wife and I have been lucky to have a lot of friends that uh, live in Asia. So we actually have like an informal network of of friends in in China, Japan, Korea, and Thailand. So uh, it's, it's it's sort of built on a on an academic basis. That's um, constructed from real-time reports from real people in those countries. Well, it shows in your writing, and, and you've had just an excellent series and, and perspectives and stories in in a lot of your articles that I showed here when we, uh, when we first began. Charles, we're, as usual, past our hard line. Uh, could you tell our listeners how they could learn more about your work and your website and the things that um, that you're working on now? Please visit me at www.of2minds.com. Uh, we'll talk to you again next month. Okay. Thank you, Gordon. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com. <laughs>